a major waste product of phosphate mining in Florida, phosphogypsum. So joining me right now by Zoom to talk about that is Reagan Whitlock, and he is staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Reagan. Hey, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad you could come on to talk about this issue. It's a very important issue, kind of going you know, pretty quickly through the legislature, almost under the radar when it comes to a lot of the, the uh, big headlines as far as social issues go, kind of uh, the culture war issues have been grabbing a lot of headlines, but this is something that's really happening in the legislature and happening fast. And we'll get all to that in just a second, but let's get a little bit of background first. Uh, why don't we start with what is phosphate mining? Where does it occur in Florida and what is phosphate used for? Absolutely. Fantastic question. Uh, there, phosphate mining happens all across southwest and south central west Florida in an area we call Bone Valley. Uh, this area is incredibly rich with phosphate ore just because of the nature of the geology in the area. And phosphate is mined and then ultimately used in phosphate based fertilizers. But as we've come to, to learn as Floridians over the last few decades, there are two toxic byproducts that are created along with this process to make phosphate fertilizer. These are phosphogypsum and processed wastewater. And these are the two radioactive toxic wastes created during the process of making phosphate-based fertilizer. And this is an incredibly inefficient process. It's important to remember that five tons of this waste product are created for every one ton of phosphoric acid produced. You touched on the process. Why don't you go a little bit more into detail about it, especially maybe giving it in context of the the nature, Florida's nature, and where the phosphate is and what happens to the land while it's being mined and then being processed? Certainly. The way this all starts is that a mine will, will crop up in the middle of this Bone Valley area of Florida. And the first thing that has to happen in order for the phosphate ore to be reached is a massive layer of overburden, is what it's called in the, in the phosphate mining world, has to be removed. This is, includes topsoil and includes a, a variety of trees and shrubs and the biodiversity that Florida is known for is removed in order for these companies to be able to reach the precious finite phosphate ore that lies beneath the surface. So it's a big process that kind of really destroys the land. It leaves these giant open pits and then when you, as you said, the the two products that are created, this wastewater, the processed wastewater, and the phosphogypsum have to be stored somewhere. How is it generally stored? Certainly. So right now, the Environmental Protection Agency only allows this stuff to be stored in these massive gyp stacks. They look like mountainous heaps off in the distance. Many Floridians are likely familiar with the Piney Point facility or the New Wales facility. You know, these look like mountains in a landscape of, of flatness around Florida. And these are required to be stored in these mountainous heaps because as it stands right now, there is no safe way to dispose of this product other than to store it away from folks. And it's interesting that you mentioned Piney Point and New Wales. Typically, uh, a Florida resident might not the, know the name of a, one of these gyp stacks, but the reason we know the names of these two is because of environmental disasters that have happened there. Remind people what happened at New Wales a few years ago. Absolutely. And it, it's exactly as you said, when folks know what the names of these facilities are, it likely means something bad happened there. The New Wales facility has a, a, a torrid history of environmental contamination, including four major sinkholes at this site. People may remember the 2016 sinkhole where hundreds of millions of gallons of phosphogypsum and processed wastewater were dumped directly into the Florida aquifer. This looks like a massive waterfall plumbing directly into the earth. And this was, it received international coverage, BBC, Al Jazeera, folks all around the world were tuning in to listen and understand what's happening at this New Wales fossil gypsum site. I want to remind people that our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We're talking about phosphogypsum, which is a waste product of phosphate mining in Florida and presumably other places that it's mined in the world. Uh, so one of the reasons we're talking about this today is because yesterday the Florida Senate gave its final approval to a bill. The bill is HB 1191. It allows the State Department of Transportation to study phosphogypsum in aggregate materials in road construction. 
But also yesterday, 35 organizations and businesses, including yours, sent a letter to Governor DeSantis urging him to veto that bill because of concerns over water quality and public health. You can read that letter. It's on WMNF.org. So what concerns of water quality and public health are you worried about, Reagan? Yeah, we are extremely frustrated that the Florida legislature has chosen to cater to the phosphate industry once again at the, at the expense of Floridians and our environment. The Environmental Protection Agency has found the use of phosphogypsum in roadway construction presents an unacceptably high danger, dangerous cancer risk to road construction workers and can cause adverse effects to nearby surface and groundwater resources. Floridians need accountability from the industry that makes billions annually from our precious resources, and this is a massive step in the wrong direction. In the letter that you signed, it, the letter says the unreasonably short study period ending on April 1st, 2024 cannot even begin to thoroughly review the health and safety consequences. So they have 11 months to come up with a conclusion that whether this is safe or not. And it's no secret that I, the study isn't even designed to, to look at the environmental health and safety consequences. There were several amendments to these bills offered that were shut down, which would have required DOT to work with either the EPA or the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to ensure that this study accounts for Floridians' health and the safety of our environment. Those amendments were shot down. It appears as though this study is only aimed at determining whether or not Fossil gypsum can be used from a construction standpoint. So, in other words, regardless of whether it's safe for humans or for the environment. Absolutely. The, the safety of Floridians in our environment seems to not even be on the table at this point. The EPA has already extensively studied. I, I want, I'd like to know more about what the EPA found and, and why they decided that it wasn't safe to use phosphogypsums in, phosphogypsum in roads. Sure. In an independent expert study, the EPA found that it presents unacceptably dangerous cancer risks to road construction workers. The frontline workers that would be handling this stuff on a daily basis would be exposed to a cancer risk. And this is in addition to the groundwater leachate of heavy metals into our bays and waterways, the, the resuspension of radionuclides, a, a cancerous substance into the air from, from vehicular traffic on these road systems. EPA has found that this is not a safe project. I want to remind people that our, my guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about phosphogypsum and what it means in Florida. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live on May 2nd from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I'd be happy to take your phone calls or your emails Email dj at wmnf.org. You can phone 813-239-9663. If you'd like to text 813-433-0885. And if you sign your text, I'm way more likely to read it on the air. Let us know where you're where you're sending that message from. I'm going to read a little bit more, Reagan, from that letter that, uh, that, that the environmental groups, including yours, sent to the governor requesting a veto about this. And it talks about um, radiation. Phosphogypsum presents very high levels of gross alpha and beta radiation, 10 to 100 picocuries per gram relative to later levels in typical soils, which are, are about one picocurie per gram. So 10 to 100 times the concentration of these alpha and beta rate, the alpha and beta radiation than is found in, in background uh, levels in the, in the ground. And there's the EPA found that phosphogypsum contains appreciable quantities of radium-226, uranium, and other uranium decay products. And the letter points out that radium-226 has a 1,600-year half-life and will outlive many roads throughout the state. So this isn't a problem that, that we have to worry about just now. If, if this material has a half-life of 1,600 years, this is something that generations, many, many generations to come would have to worry about. Exactly. It, Hurricane Ian was a stark reminder of this point last year. Our roads and, and bridges in the state of Florida are not going to be here forever. We will have increasingly frequent and dangerous storms that will collapse the, the Sanibel Causeway, for example, last year into the sea and roads get washed out throughout Arcadia and DeSoto County, Florida. It's, it's a, a horrible fact that these road systems will either need to be redone or can collapse into our bays and waterways and a 1600 year cancerous half-life on this product shows that this will be resuspended into the air. This will become a problem for Floridians, perhaps not myself, but perhaps future generations for a long time to come. 
If you have a question for Reagan Whitlock with the Center for Biological Diversity, give us a call, 813-239-9663. This is live on May 2nd. And uh, we're going to go now, If I think if I can put him on the air. Uh, yeah, here we go. Chris in Clearwater, what would you like to ask our guest? Well, isn't this radioactive waste uh, from the gyps stacks? I, I've been following this bill for a couple months and and uh, had a chance to call in a Sunday forum about to warn folks about it, the fact that EPA had proposed or had uh, allowed allowed gyps stack material for road construction, and then they uh, reversed themselves. I think it was last year, but um, you know, this is all radio. It's not just uh, heavy metals; it's uh, radioactive isotopes, and and you know you. You look at uh, the annual water quality analysis, and it says that the likely source of contamination for alpha and beta photon emitters here in Pinellas County is industrial way, industrial uh, runoff. And uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it, this is just another way that uh, phosphate mining is trying to uh, not have to pay to properly dispose of their waste, but rather sell it. And uh, another way they do that is water fluoridation, where you know, they add the the uh, industrial discharge that it says is on the annual water quality analysis here in Pinellas County. Hey, Chris, yeah. I'm going to move on because I think that you made some really good points there. And I want to bring our guest in about this, especially so a couple of the things that Chris was mentioning. One is this is a way for an industry to get rid of its waste by selling it to road construction companies. Uh, why don't you address that one first? Yeah, absolutely. And that was, a, that was a great call. I completely agree. This creates another revenue stream for corporations that simply do not need it. Last year, the Mosaic Company made more than $3 billion in the state of Florida. This is it, it's an outrageous handout to the phosphate industry who needs accountability. They do not need another waste stream or another, another revenue stream. Another revenue stream. And another uh, point that Chris brought up was that the EPA had actually approved this back in, I think it was 2020. What's the story about the EPA approving it then? And why was that reversed? Right. And another great point to bring up. Under the Trump administration in 2020, the Environmental Protection Agency did authorize a request from the Fertilizer Institute to begin looking at and using fossil gypsum in road construction. And after a petition from several environmental organizations, uh, including the Center for Biological Diversity and an ensuing lawsuit, the EPA withdrew that authorization. And we are back to the standard practice of this must be stored in gyp stacks because it is simply unsafe to use otherwise. All right. Well, thank you for those points, Chris. Thanks for bringing that up. And I want to remind people that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and my guest is Reagan Whitlock, staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about all things phosphogypsum today, and there's so much going on, not just this bill that we've just talked about that is uh, heading to the governor's desk for, for possible signature, but uh, we'll get to some other things about Piney Point and, and, and some other issues that have to do with phosphogypsum and phosphate mining. And I certainly welcome your uh, input on this show. In fact, Daryl writes, isn't there a road in uh, in Polk, Polk City, I think he says, that that's made out of Gypsum Stack Foundation stuff? And I don't know the answer to that. Reagan, do you know? Yes, indeed. There were two roads uh, that were demonstration projects back in the 80s before the EPA in 1992 came out with its scientific findings that this was presents an unacceptably high cancer risk and risk to our environment. So there were two test projects in the state of Florida, and I invite anyone to look up where those roads were and drive to them and, and understand what happens to our roadways over the course of 40 or 50 years. All right, thanks. So it looks like we have another call, and this is from Dave in Sarasota. And I think, Dave, were you going to ask about the EPA being uh, approving? Oh, you're, you're talking about Piney Point now. But why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Dave? Hi, um, I was just wondering if the EPA approved um, of the state of Florida's plan to dump the traded wastewater from Piney Point into the ground, and and what what Reagan follow follow that measure? All right, thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for that question. And so, why don't we back up a little bit um, while we answer Dave's question, and we'll we'll remind people what what Piney Point is and what happened there, please, Reagan. Yeah, absolutely. Piney Point is a, a problematic stack system directly on Tampa Bay. And, and folks may remember the disastrous 2021 Piney Point release. This was a, a situation where the gyp stack had a, a structural failure 
And there was a threat of a, a, a complete collapse that would have sent a, a tidal wave, this material, into a nearby town. And as a result, more than 300 families were evacuated over a few-day period. And ultimately, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection authorized a massive release of this toxic water into Tampa Bay. And over that time, more than 180 metric tons of nitrogen were dumped directly into Tampa Bay, which ultimately fueled a deadly red tide that killed more than 600 tons of dead marine life in Tampa Bay alone. This is one of the worst instances of environmental contamination from a stack system in the state of Florida, and there have been a lot over time. And I think there were some people at the time trying to say, well, you know, red tide just happens sometimes, and sometimes it's bad, and sometimes it's not so bad. And maybe it was just a coincidence that the the Piney Point wastewater was dumped into Tam Tampa Bay right before this incredibly massive red tide that lasted for a really long time and spread far and wide. But is there evidence that it was the nitrogen from Piney Point specifically that, that uh, at least contributed to making this red tide so severe? Yes, there's a new study that shows that the Piney Point release likely made the red tide much worse. It is true that red tide is naturally occurring and has happened throughout the history of the state of Florida, but the algal bloom feeds on nutrients. The algal bloom feeds on nitrogen. And over the course of that release, Tampa Bay received more nitrogen from the Piney Point release than it receives from all other sources throughout a given year. So we provided that algal bloom its favorite food. And what a coincidence that would be if it just happened to become awful in 2021 after we provided it with its food source. And so uh, the solution, I guess, right now is for Piney Point is they've begun to drill wells down into the aquifer and beyond about uh, to get rid of this wastewater. So at the top of Piney Point, it's almost it's shaped like a bowl at the top, and it contains all this wastewater, high nutrient concentrations, above background levels of radioactivity. What to do with that water? Well, we certainly don't want to dump it into Tampa Bay again. We certainly don't want it to cause an avalanche and destroy uh, everything in its wake below it. Uh, so what to do with it? And Finally, there's a they've they've started to drill. What are the concerns that you have with drilling and pumping this uh, wastewater down below the ground? Certainly, and, and to clarify, they've they finished drilling, and the uh, the underground injection well is now accepting this uh, waste from from Piney Point. And underpinning this entire discussion is the understanding that these gyp stacks do have problems. We need increased oversight from EPA. We need better oversight from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The gyp stack solution is not a solution, but neither is underground injection wells and neither is paving this stuff into our roadways. You know, this is an effort to get the waste out of sight, out of mind. But we fear that this will not be the final chapter in Piney Point's history of environmental contamination. The basic fact is that underground injection wells are an unproven method to dispose of fossil gypsum. These wells have failed in the past, and if this well, well were to fail, it could potentially dump untold amounts of hazardous waste directly into the Florida aquifer. And just recently, I think it was last week, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection came up with a plan, a, a Clean Water Act uh, remedy, perhaps, for Piney Point. Tell us about the history of Clean Water Act uh, actions when it comes to Piney Point. Certainly. One of the biggest problems with the Piney Point facility is it has been either operating without a Clean Water Act permit or operating under an expired Clean Water Act permit for more than 20 years. These permits so set pollution limits and monitoring requirements aimed at preventing the exact kind of release that happened in 2021. So while we're happy that there are there's finally oversight uh, through the means of a permit at this facility, it's too little too late for Floridians in our environment. Tampa Bay is still reeling from what happened in 2021, and now a permit is now his given for the facility. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and my guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about phosphogypsum on this show, and you're, we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. Let's go back to the phone lines right now and see what Lenny in St. Petersburg has to say. Hi, Lenny. Lenny, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, I'm a member of a group. It's called Florida Right. To clean water, and we are trying to put a uh, amendment on the ballot for the 2024 election. And this amendment would vote our right to clean water, and it 
states that clean water is a right for Florida citizens. And it also provides that uh, citizens can sue a state agencies like the Florida Department of Environmental Protection if they're not, if they're going to cause harm or if an action that they will take will cause harm. So uh, I invite people to look at FloridaRightToCleanWater.org and look at that website and uh, download the petition, sign it, and mail it to the Secretary of uh, Secretary of State. All right, thank you for that thoughts. And uh, we have information on our website, WMNF.org about the Florida Right to Clean Water movement. So thank you, Lenny, for pointing out that FloridaRightToCleanWater.org has more information as well. Any thoughts on, on that uh, amendment and what it might mean for Florida's environment, Reagan? I can't speak to the amendment or the petition. It's not something that I've I've read uh, in depth, but I, I can say I completely agree with any uh, any efforts to restore clean water or to you know, provide citizens access to clean water. Phosphate and phosphogypsum, and this all goes back to clean water. We saw in 2021 when the waste was dumped into Tampa Bay that we didn't have clean water. And that affects not only Floridians and the, the tourism industry, but it affects our, our endangered species. It affects everything that relies on the quality of Tampa Bay. I should point out now that the, you know, the phosphate industry, what it says is that it, it needs to mine the mineral phosphate in Florida because it provides fertilizer to farmers to feed the world. Are there alternatives to phosphorus and phosphate um, uh, fertilizers and that kind of farming? Certainly. I think this is a, a two-pronged discussion. The first one is, what are the alternatives to the current methods of or, uh, fertilizer production in the state of Florida? And of course, there are there are alternatives. There are regenerative, sustainable agricultural practices that can find ways to use phosphorus without, without it having to come from a finite resource that's in our ground, much like the use of fossil fuels. But the second prong of this argument is if these companies are going to mine the way that they're going to, there needs to be more accountability over their entire process. Right now, FDEP has been delegated extensive Clean Water Act authority to regulate these fossil gypsum stacks, and they have done a horrible job over time. We saw with New Wales in 2016, with Piney Point in 2021, you know, Piney Point, that event happened without a permit issued by FDEP to guide it. This could have potentially stopped the issue when it, it first emerged, not when it was threatening 300 families directly downriver from this facility. We need accountability. Our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the WMNF studios in Tampa. And we have a couple more phone calls to get to right now. Let's hear from DeAndre in Tampa. Hi, DeAndre. What's on your mind? I'm curious about, hey, thank you, uh, John, and I uh, appreciate uh, the, the, the rep coming and uh, discussing this. I'm curious about a hard list of all the Fish, well, like such, uh, well, I mean, all of the uh, deep injection well, like uh, maybe results, like uh, anything that maybe resulted in catastrophe outside of this piney point. Uh, well, not piney point, but uh, do you have a hard list of anything that might have resulted from deep injection well, welling around Florida so far today? Thanks for the question, DeAndre. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question. Uh, my organization has not put out one of these lists, but I I know recent news outlets, uh, CW44 and others, have had stories under the uh, underground injection well that have uh, tabulated and uh, shown examples of these wells failing in the past. And I think something that's incredibly important to remember is that this well is not set to handle hazardous waste. By definition, Florida does not allow hazardous waste to be dumped into underground injection wells, but through a regulatory loophole, Phosphogypsum and processed wastewater are currently not regulated as hazardous waste, even though they have been found to have the constituency of toxic and hazardous wastes. Maybe describe what an injection well is. What does it look like? Where is the drill? Where is the, um, the injection site? And how far down does it go? And where does that in relation to our aquifers? Certainly. It's a great question. The, the Piney Point underground injection wells in Manatee County. And uh, the best description of it is this is a well that goes directly down into the earth, hundreds and hundreds of feet down. 
and directly into our Floridan aquifer. So if this well were to fail, this material would go directly into our drinking water supply. I want to remind people that our guest is Reagan Whitlock. He is a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe from the broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. A lot of people are calling in, asking their questions about this. We're broadcasting live on May 2nd. And if you want to call in, the number is 813-239-9663. I'm reading emails and, and text messages as well. You can email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. And Bernard, Bernie, that is, writes in, uh, gypsum also contains fool's gold. And when that's introduced with oxygenated water, it dissolves into arsenic. He says that 20 years of well drilling all over Florida for water. It sounds like that's his experience. And do you know what do you know about arsenic in uh, in well water that's been drilled? Absolutely. Part of the fossil gypsum and processed wastewater, an understanding of this issue is to realize what all is in this stuff, right? Not only is it radioactive, not only is it toxic and toxic and corrosive, but it also contains an incredible amount of nutrients, just like what we saw when Piney Point dumped into Tampa Bay. And it also contains very high levels of heavy metals. Uh, to the, the underground injection well, arsenic is, is a great note. Make no mistake, this is hazardous waste. Outside of fossil gypsum and processed wastewater, the, uh, their own testing of the waste stream going into the underground injection wells shows that it has amounts of arsenic that are above the maximum contaminant levels allowed by the Environmental Protection Agency. So this is hazardous on multiple levels. How many of these stacks are around Florida? Do we have an idea of how, how big they are and how many there are and what that means as far as this phosphogypsum pollution? That's a great question. And and it's worth remembering that these corporations are constantly seeking to either create new mines and thus new fossil gypsum stacks or to expand current fossil gypsum stacks. We have more than 30 across the state of Florida, and we currently have more than 1 billion tons of fossil gypsum already stored in gyp stacks across the state, and more than 30 million tons are generated every single year. Where is it that new phosphate mining is being proposed? Southwest Florida, DeSoto County, and expanding into the Southwest Florida area of Bone Valley is, is where the phosphate industry is seeking to expand their operations. And your group uh, oftentimes is, is behind efforts to slow that down or try to stop those mines. Uh, what's happening on that front? Absolutely. And it's a, it's a long and slow process, much like <clears throat> lawsuits in, in the federal court over Piney Point. These take a long time. These applications get uh, proposed and then they get pulled. There is currently a, an application in DeSoto County to mine along Horse Creek, which could potentially contaminate the Peace River and, and, and Horse Creek. And the application is currently on hold. We don't know when it will come back, but we assume that it will. And we assume that there will be an, another fight to happen. Well, let's tr go back to the phone calls and we'll hear from John in Tampa. Hi, John. What would you like to say? Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Uh, and Reagan, thanks for taking some time to do this. Um, I think a few minutes ago you stated that there's there's several stacks already across the state and um, that gyp stacks are, you know are not the answer for the phosphate industry and how to properly store the waste or use the waste and wells aren't either. I was just curious if you had um, some practical solutions for what to do with the stacks in the future or, or you know how we maybe do expose the kid get rid of these stacks or what what is CBD is a solution to this problem? Yeah, that's a, another fantastic question. <clears throat> I, I think the first thing to address there is what we're hearing from the Florida legislature and others about alternatives to gyp stack systems. It's a misnomer that the using fossil gypsum in road construction is an alternative to gyp stacks. That was something that came along with these bills, this idea that we have to get it out of the gyp stacks and putting it into roads will deplete what we have in the gyp stack systems. And that's absolutely incorrect. You know, I stated just a minute ago that we have more than 1 billion tons of this material currently stored in gyp stacks across the state. Putting it in our roadways is a drop in that well, considering we have 30 million tons generated every single year. The, the, the unfortunate fact is this stuff is going to remain in gyp stacks. And unfortunately, that may be the safest alternative at this time. But the solution, the solution that the center has consistently advocated for is increased oversight of those systems. 
When we pave phosphogypsum into roads across the state of Florida, I liken it to ticking time bombs. This stuff is scattered. It's not concentrated. One roadway could go down in a storm, and that becomes the next issue. When we have it in gyp stacks, we at least have a singular area that we can understand. Like I said, Piney Point in 2021, that massive failure of the gyp stack happened when there was no permit over the site. If we could have increased oversight from the Environmental Protection Agency, if we could have better oversight from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, including the proper use of permits, we could potentially abate the harm from these systems, or we could at least stop issues like what happened in 2021. I want to remind people that our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe on 88.5 FM. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I there's another, we've we've talked about the gyp stacks, we've talked about phosphogypsum being potentially used in roads. All of these uh these are that that bill is heading to the desk of the Florida governor. But here's another uh, issue that has to do with phosphate mining. I'm reading a headline from today's Herald Times Tallahassee Bureau. It says, legislators want to end local fertilizer bans. Critics say it's a, go- a gift to the phosphate industry. So how is the pho- how would the phosphate industry benefit from having the local uh, rules for, for um, nutrients on your people's lawns and so forth be banned? Certainly. Nutrient inundation into our bays and waterways is a primary driver of the decline of water quality across the state. It leads to algal blooms. It it generally leads to a decline in water quality, and that affects our endangered species. It affects our sport fishing and our charter captains. It affects our tourism industry. It affects all of Florida. And it seems through pieces of legislation like this that the only folks who are being held accountable for this are the counties and the people, not the industry that creates this massive amount of nutrient pollution. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, and I'd like to hear what you think about about uh, phosphogypsum in Florida and what's happening in the Florida legislature when it comes to phosphate mining and uh, what the Times-Herald headline says is that critics say is a gift to, phos- to the phosphate industry, one of them being an end to local fertilizer bans, another being putting this uh, industrial waste into roads. What do you think? The number to call in if you're call- we're broadcasting live on May 2nd is 813-239-9663, or you can text us at 813-433-0885. Or if you'd like, you can email DJ at WMNF.org. John in Port Ritchie writes, is there any way to clean the waste byproducts so that it can be used? What what would you, how would you answer that, Reagan? What can be do, done to clean the waste after it's been used? Certainly, the, the waste that sits in the phosphogypsum stacks can be treated with reverse osmosis processes. There are ways to treat this waste while it's in the gyp stack system. But unfortunately, time becomes a factor. You know, we have issues like the new whale system with four massive sinkholes and a confirmed liner tear in 2022 of last year, and the piney point with a history of releases, including the massive 2021 release. Unfortunately, the structural integrity of these stack systems creates significant issues. If they were to be safely stored on site where groundwatering around the, the groundwater around the site is monitored, where the structural integrity of the sites is constantly monitored and, and kept safe, we could treat this water. But unfortunately, the lack of oversight and the industry's greed has led to this stuff continuously entering our bays and waterways. You know, as you were saying that, I was re- recalling both our history of what how we've been covering, for example, Piney Point, and in my research for this show, going back and looking at all of the old articles that we've been doing. For years, we would cover the Manatee County Commission, and they're saying, they would say, it's an emergency. We need to do something now about Piney Point. And then six months later, they'd still be saying that. What are we going to do? We have to do something now. And then boom, all of a sudden there's this literal emergency and they ended up dumping 200 million gallons of water, wasted wastewater and, and uh, new nutrients into Tampa Bay, which led to an emergency in and of itself with the red tide and so forth. So it's a problem that we know exists, and it's a problem that we know always, you know, it continues, and yet 
finding the right solutions and having the maybe the political will and the economic will to actually take care of this problem is something that, you know, it, it doesn't happen very quickly or very easily. And I think maybe that leads me to this question. Um, what's the responsibility of the state and the local governments and the people of the state of Florida to clean it up compared with the the um, maybe the responsibility of the industry that created these pollutants to create to to come up with a solution and to clean it up? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a fantastic question. I think the only way to start that conversation is to say that the buck stops with the industry who's creating this waste. Like I said, one corporation in the state of Florida made more than $3 billion last year off of our precious finite resources. They have the money. They have the ability to increase safety at their stack systems and to prohibit things like this from happening in the future. You mentioned a minute ago that the, the emergency at the Piney Point stack system. I, I continue to harp on this fact that it wasn't just the threat to Tampa Bay. This was released into Tampa Bay to avert the potential loss of life you know, the endangerment of human safety. We had 300 families evacuated from their homes because there was a possibility that their homes were about to be collapsed by a tidal wave of radioactive hazardous waste. You know, and eventually what happened in Tampa Bay was a catastrophe in and of itself. But it's worth remembering that there are threats to human safety in addition to the threats to our environment. And back to accountability, it must be the phosphate industry. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection must also issue permits as they're supposed to over these systems. There needs to be oversight, certainly, but the management is where this starts. And these corporations have the ability to ensure the safety of these stack systems, and they are not doing it. So far, we've mostly talked about what what happens after the mining process after what to do with the waste but there's another concerning aspect of phosphate mining and that's how much of florida's near perfect drinking water that's used in the uh, the mining of of phosphate the, the uh, companies need water for their mining operations and so they just dig down into the 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 same water that where we bottle it and sell it on the grocery store shelves they mine down there and they use it as uh, as part of the industrial process. So talk about how, how Florida's water resources are used by this industry. Yes, that's a, a very important thing to remember that it's not just the waste that's created from mining that becomes a problem. And it, it, it absolutely is. And I'd love to, to continue that conversation. But the mine sites themselves pose incredible environmental risks. We mentioned at the outset of this conversation that mining starts with the removal of topsoils. It starts with the removal of trees. It displaces biodiversity and it irreparably changes the landscape. When the mining is done, when these corporations have gotten all of the phosphate ore out of the ground that they can possibly get and they want to go about their merry way and start a new mine, they must enter into this reclamation process, which is only a, a, a somewhat recent development that mine sites are, are meant to attempt to recreate the landscape that was there before them. And unfortunately, it is an imperfect science. And the corporations who are who practice it understand this. There are no studies that show that the same level of biodiversity and wildlife existing before a mine was there can exist after. Uh, mine site reclamation is merely a way to create a reasonable facsimile of what the landscape was beforehand. And I consistently like to say that you're attempting to create by man something that was naturally made perfect. It is impossible to do this. And I certainly don't trust the corporations to be the ones who lead this process. Our guest is, Ryan, is Reagan Whitlock with the Center for Biological Diversity, the staff attorney there. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. And I'm Sean Canan. We're talking about phosphogypsum and the waste product that's produced by phosphate mining. Just yesterday, the Florida Senate approved a bill, and it's now heading to the Florida governor's desk to try out to see whether phosphate can be phosphate phosphogypsum that is can be used in road construction in Florida. The EPA has already said it is far too dangerous to use in road construction, but apparently Florida um, wants to give it another go and have that have the answer in eleven months. 
um, April 1st of next year is the deadline. So uh, that's what we're talking about today. And we're, we welcome your contributions. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. So here's one I is something I haven't thought of. So I don't know um, if it's a serious question or 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 what. So area code eight one three asks why can't they turn the material into a giant battery? Is there something about phosphogypsum or uh, phosphogypsum stacks that uh, would lend itself to being battery components? And that's another thing that we've heard uh, routinely in other states. There's a a drive to find other battery sources you know, across the nation. And that coincides with the drive to try to find something to do with this uh, phosphogypsum byproduct. And I'll, I'll consistently go back to the same answer that EPA currently requires this stuff to be stored in these mountainous heaps, these gyp stacks far away from people, because there is no proven way to safely dispose of it. That includes paving it into our roads. That includes putting it deep into underground wells. And unfortunately, it includes trying to recycle this product into some sort of battery material. You know, the fact is the industry would love if they could receive another revenue stream off of this toxic waste. And that's exactly what they were able to do in the Florida legislature this year. Instead of increased accountability, they were able to get increased net profit. And my fear is that if we continue to go down the rabbit hole of new and improved batteries that include phosphate-based fertilizer, we're going to increase these mines across Southwest Florida. We're going to increase phosphogypsum storage, and we're going to further expose Floridians and our environments to the environmental repercussions. We have another question here coming in from Bob, who's on the line. Hey, Bob, what would you like to ask? Hey, good morning. Um, great conversation in in reclamation of uh, of land that's been wiped out by phosphate mines. It's laughable. Anyway. Um, I'm an activist and I fight for trees a lot in front of uh, the city council and just had a discussion last night with Clearwater. And I found that local municipalities um, tend to be fighting with the activists and with people that want to stop things, but they are just so understaffed and so overwhelmed that they, they really can't do what is right most of the time. And they're just doing their best to sort of do what they can. Then you've got the state that I have no idea why they are, I don't know if anybody does, why they're doing what they're doing to sort of undermine, no pun intended, um, you know, the, the environmental safety. And I was just asking your guest, is it is it his belief that, municipalities want to push back on things that are bad for the environment but they they just they just don't have the clout the lawyers the money to to push back on these industries that seem to have a hold on um the folks up in tallahassee so i'm, I'm curious what he thinks about uh about that and i'll take my answer off air thank right. you Really good question, Bob. Let's let's put that to our guest reagan whitlock a staff attorney with the center for biological diversity how is how can uh, municip local municipalities help their local environments when there's so much pressure from industry and from the state? Absolutely, it's another fantastic question, and I, I do I completely agree with the caller. The there are local municipalities who have stood up to these industry giants, and it it, it is difficult and it is a scary thing to do. But we're incredibly supportive and appreciative of when, say, Charlotte County passes a resolution that supports DeSoto's uh, rejection of Mosaic's application to mine there. The same thing with the Northport uh, city commissioners did something very similar. These municipalities can pass resolutions. They can pass ordinances. They can ban gyp stacks in their county and in their locality. They can make it extremely difficult for these industries to really rejected uh, Mosaic's request to mine in their county in 2018, and they'll likely have to do it again. It's possible for these counties, municipalities, and towns all across the state of Florida to stand up for their landscape, to stand up for their residents, and to say that this is not safe for our residents and the people who elected us to office. And we incredibly support those who have done it, and we we hope more and more do across the state of Florida. I want to remind people in the last few minutes we have that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. My guest is Reagan Whitlock, a, a staff attorney for the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about phosphate mining and phosphogypsum. 
And uh, we we have just a few more minutes left, but I hope that you continue to tune in. And I want to remind you that next hour on WaveMakers, Janet and Tom Sherberger will be speaking with journalist Jason Garcia, who will join them to talk about the DeSantis versus Disney saga. So that's another uh, really hot topic here in, in Florida. So I hope that people continue to tune into WMNF all day long, but especially next hour, it's going to be a great show with Janet and Tom Sherberger. And right now, uh, our guest again, as I said, is Reagan Whitlock with the Center for Biological Diversity. We got this email that came in from Greg. He asks, do the phosphate companies get to charge the state for this radioactive material and make money while the state disposed of the material that there's no way to dispose of safely? So I think that there's a lot of tongue in cheek there in Greg's question. But a cent but uh, you know, I think that uh, his point might be that that there is value perhaps in in some of this material and uh, that is there going to be money changing ha hands if there if there is this uh, this push to put the phosphogypsum in the roads? Another another great question, and I think it there are different ways that this has been attempted to be disposed of. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that perhaps there's a there's some possible revenue or there's some possible money that could come from this waste. And and unfortunately, our, we say no. We say that there is no way for this to be disposed of in any way that has value. This is simply a valueless, radioactive, toxic product. And uh, the emailer is completely right. There is a threat that this could either become an issue for taxpayers. The underground injection well in Manatee County cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. This is an issue that potentially taxpayers could have to bear the result of. They certainly had to bear the consequences of the 2021 Piney Point release. You know, this is an issue. We don't know what's going to happen with the phosphogypsum road construction. We hope the EPA steps in and stops this before it ever gets started. But there's certainly a chance that it could be become a, a burden on the taxpayers in their area, that it could become a burden on the state of Florida, who already has to deal with the environmental consequences to somehow pay the industry more money on top of the billions that they make every single year because of this waste. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more question from Layla and Brandon. Hi, Layla. Okay. Yes. The question is: Is that um, why? Um, why didn't someone step forward from Mosaic, or why wasn't Mosaic held accountable with the phosphate industry in relocating with uh, tanker trucks the waste at Piney Point and letting it be decontaminated at the phos phosphate mines relay lakes that exist already? Very good question. Let's see if uh, Reagan has a way to answer that in about 30 seconds. <laughs> sure. And it's important to remember that Mosaic was not the owner of, of the Piney Point facility. Mosaic is the owner of the New Wales facility in Mulberry, Florida. And there's a variety of different uh, phosphate corporations that operate around the state. And I think to simply and quickly answer that question is when we can safely keep this stuff on site and limit the transport, limit the ways that we are moving this around our state, the safer we're all, we will all be. And these industries should be held accountable. You're absolutely right. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe today, Reagan. Thank you for having me, Sean. Thank you so much. Reagan Whitlock is staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. You can watch this interview on WMNF.org beginning this afternoon. Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. WMNF Tampa will be back next Tuesday at 10. We'll talk about how to get affordable health care, even as thousands of Floridians are losing access to Medicaid. This is WMNF Tampa.